and welcome to the online version of our first vocabulary assignment. So I want to run through this lesson very quickly for you. Make sure you're taking all of the notes that I give so that you can turn them in and receive credit for them. Okay, any assignments that do not have the notes attached to them will lose points for not having those notes attached. Okay, so pay attention. Fast forward the video if you need to. Rewind it back whenever you need to. Pause it as you need to. Make sure that you take the notes. First of all, make sure that you have your proper heading on the top of your paper. Teach segment where I deliver information to you. First thing, copy down your objectives. This is what we're going to learn by the end of this lesson. We are going to consult specific reference material to define five grade level appropriate vocabulary terms. Okay, so that means we're going to do 12th grade level terms and 9th grade level terms. A man's not very tired. He is exhausted. And don't use very sad news. Come on, Mr. Overstreet, you twerp. Morose? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Morose. Now, language was developed for one endeavor, and that is... Mr. Anderson, come on, are you a man or an amoeba? Mr. <laughs> Perry. To communicate. No! To woo women. <laughs> they were going to be talking about... What was he trying to accomplish with his students? He was trying to actually enhance their vocabulary. That's what he was trying to do. If you notice what he was doing, he was switching out the smaller words with more academically astute terminology. Okay, so he said that a man is not very tired, he is exhausted. And do not say uh, very sad, say morose. So that's our purpose for studying vocabulary. It may seem elementary, but we actually need it when we need to call on it. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is just a pretest, and I want you to go through, I want you to write these down. Again, if you're in 12th grade, you would want to fast forward this to the actual 12th grade words, and then come back for the teaching of the rest of it. But right now, this is the 9th grade material. Okay, so you would write down this word, and you would go ahead and define which option you pick. Does this word mean A? Do you think it means B? Or do you think it means C? Which one? Make a choice. I'm going to scroll down to number two. There's a total of five. Okay? You're going to write the second word, the third word, the fourth, and the fifth, and you're going to make a selection of the meaning of the word between A, B, and C. Let's get started. Okay, so now the first thing that I want you to insert into your notes is a definition for the word consult. Because you might be confused already on what we're talking about when we say consult. When we say consult, add this in, write this in. We mean to go to for information. When we say consult, we're going to go to for information. Now, for this lesson, I do have some guiding questions. One of my guiding questions would have been, which words do you not understand? Okay, so you would have figured that out as you went through words one through five, you would have recognized them or you would not have recognized them. Maybe you recognized them and you did not know the meaning of them. Maybe you recognized them, but you didn't know how to say them. Which words did you not understand? 
Now my second question is, what authoritative, reliable source can we go to in order to define the words history, its meaning, and its part of speech? You may say a dictionary, some people may say online, or even a thesaurus. If you think about what Robin Williams was doing, he was acting as a thesaurus. A dictionary would be one answer. A dictionary gives you an elongated phrase of a definition for a word. A thesaurus would be another source that we could go to. It gives you a one-word synonym for a word. Or we could use modern technology and just go online. I'm going to specifically use dictionary.com in order to look up my words. And for the test, the definitions are going to come from dictionary.com. But it really doesn't matter where you go because the meaning of words are universal. So the definitions are always going to be extremely similar. So if we go on dictionary.com, let's say that we do not know how to pronounce the word. How would we know where to go in order to pronounce it? Some people may say we could press the speaker icon. If we press the speaker icon, it would definitely tell us how to pronounce the word. However, if we're in a dictionary or a thesaurus, there is no speaker icon, so how would we know how to pronounce the word? We would go right here. This is called the phonetic spelling. This is another note that I would like you to write in your notes, okay? I would also like you to write down the phonetic spelling for this word. In every reference guide for looking up the meaning of a word, you should find how to pronounce the word. And in between the brackets is always called a phonetic spelling. Add this to your notes. The phonetic spelling, and phonetic is spelled P-H-O-N-E-T-I-C. P-H-O-N-E-T-I-C, the phonetic spelling. And the phonetic spelling of a word, you will see the root word of phone in there. That means hearing. That means that these words are spelled the way that they sound. So you see that the spelling of them is different. That's because a lot of our words come from different languages. So in the phonetic spelling, even though the word may be spelled very awkwardly, we have it spelled how it sounds, okay? This is to help us to pronounce it. That's the purpose of the uh, phonetic spelling, is to help us to pronounce the word. Now, you also may see in here that there's a dash. The dash separates the syllables. A syllable is the smallest unit of sound in a word. Okay? So there's two syllables in this word. One of the syllables you can see is in bold print. Also add this to your notes. When a syllable is in bold print, that syllable receives the stress. When a syllable, syllable being S-Y-L-L-A-B-L-E, add this to your notes, S-Y-L-L-A-B-L-E. When a syllable is in bold print, that syllable receives the stress. Now you might be wondering, what is the stress? The stress means that this syllable gets more emphasis, okay? You put a little bit more sound on there. A little higher pitch may go on there, okay? You kind of double the frequency of it when you say it, okay? So you see that the emphasis goes on braille. Now, in some reference uh, material, like a dictionary or online, you may see that it doesn't have any of the syllables in bold. Maybe it puts an accent mark over it like the accent mark that we see on the E at the end of Beyonce's name. So they may use that to indicate which syllable receives the stress. But at any rate, whenever you have a word that is at least two or more syllables, one of those syllables has to have the emphasis or the stress. So in this word, it's the first syllable, but it doesn't always have to be. In this word, it's the first syllable. So the emphasis goes on rel. So it's relic. Relic. Now it could have been, if the emphasis was on the end, on the second syllable, it could have been relic. Relic. Notice the difference. Relic. Relic. Or relic. This one is relic. Okay? Hopefully you can hear the difference between those two sounds. Now, we also want to refer to the part of speech of a word. Okay? So that takes us right here. There are eight different types of parts of speech, and every single word in the English language belongs to one of those eight different parts of speech. This one is a noun. Usually, 
a lot of people know what a noun is. It's a person, place, thing, or idea. This one would be more of a thing, okay? A relic is a thing. And so we use nouns differently than we use other parts of speech. The parts of speech, you want to add this to your notes also, put parts of speech in your notes. Parts of speech. Parts of speech helps us to know how to use the word. If it's a noun, we can't use it as a verb. If it's a verb, we can't use it as an adjective. If it's an adjective, we can't use it as a prepositional phrase. Okay? So, parts of speech help us to identify how to use a word. Now we're going to go on to the definition. A lot of words have multiple definitions. So the one thing you want to do is read through all of the definitions of the word to figure out which definition fits the use that you want to use that word for. Okay? It may have completely different definitions for the word. It may have a different definition per part of speech. And it also may have different definitions that are very similar. Very, very similar. Our first rule of thumb is to make sure that you do not pick a definition that has the root word in the definition. Because that's what we're trying to define. If we don't know what the word means, we don't want part of it in the definition. Sometimes definitions give you the lazy version of the word. Okay? So you don't want you want to make sure that there's no part of the root word in the definition. Because then you'll have to go further and define that. Also, you want to make sure that you understand every single word in the definition. Because you don't want a definition that's confusing. You want a definition that fills you with information. So make sure that you understand every single word in the definition so that you know what that word means. Okay? So let's give an example. This word, relic, has three definitions to it. Now, if we read through the definitions, we'll see that they're very similar. So it really doesn't matter which one that we pick for this one. Okay, we can pick either one that we understand because they all have basically the same definition. Okay, and write these down. Pick one and write it down next to your word. So, you, so far you should have relic, the part of speech, the phonetic spelling, and now you're adding the definition to it. A surviving memorial of something past. An object having interest by reason of its age or its association with the past. A surviving trace of something. Now I'm going to show you an example of a word that changes definition based on its part of speech and a word that changes its sound based on the different part of speech. So this is the word conduct, or maybe it's the word conduct. It depends on how you want to use it. If you want to use this word as a noun, the emphasis or the stress goes on the first syllable. Conduct, okay, and this means your behavior, okay? Her conduct was terrible today. Or if you want to use it as a verb, notice how the emphasis or the stress goes on the second syllable. Conduct. I'll be the one to conduct this meeting. Thank you. Have a seat, please. It just depends on how you want to use it. Different meaning per, different part of speech, and different phonetic spelling or different emphasis per part of speech. Okay, so now I've just given you all the information that I would like to offer you on how to properly define a word, especially for my class. But those rules can help you in anyone's class, honestly. That's how you use a reference guide, okay? We consulted, as our uh, objective said, we consulted a reference guide in order to figure out how to properly define a grade level appropriate vocabulary term. So now we're going to actually switch gears and I'm going to present you with your exit ticket. If you would like to practice it on your own, you can switch to the second word. Your second word. So I provided you with five. We went over, I went over the first one for you. If you would like to, you can go over the second one. Write down the word. Go to a reference guide. You can go to a dictionary. You can ask Siri if you have an iPhone. Or you can go online and Google it, or maybe use a thesaurus. Write down the phonetic spelling, the part of speech, and a definition that you understand. Okay? Look for one of the first definitions, though. Those are the ones that I'm going to pick for the exam. Once you've done that with your second word, now we're able to move on. 
hopefully you're kind of getting the feel for how this goes. Now I want to check for your understanding. So now we're in a totally different segment of the lesson. I'm going to present to you a number of questions, four questions total, but number two has four of its own. Now the last thing that I want you to do on that sheet of paper is I want you to define the rest of the words two, three, four, and five. I want you to define the rest of those words with this layout, okay? That means that whichever line that you start on, that's line number one. Start with the word and write the part of speech next to it. Word and part of speech on whichever line that you start on. Drop down to that second line and put the phonetic spelling on the second line. Drop down to the third line and write the definition. Then move on to another line. And that's again your line number one for that next word. Write the word and the part of speech. Drop down to the line under that, that's your second line for that next word. And put the phonetic spelling, only the phonetic spelling, on that line. Then drop down to the third line for that word and write the definition and move on as such. This is the layout that I want you to have for all of your definitions in this class. It makes it easier for me to just run through and see if you met the requirements for doing your vocabulary homework. Copy this down or take a picture of it if you need to. I will pause the video at this point and copy this down. Okay, so now we're in a totally different segment of the lesson. Now we're in the independent practice segment of the lesson. So now I want you to copy down the second objective, which says to determine the proper usage of each word based on meaning and part of speech. You're going to write this down at the top of your paper. So select a brand new sheet of paper, sheet of paper, excuse me, and put your correct heading in the top right hand corner like I previously explained. And I want you to write down this objective on the top of that paper. Determine the proper usage of each word based on meaning and part of speech. And then we're going to move on to the independent practice. So now, here's the final assignment. And there are no answers to this that I've given in the previous part of the lesson. So this is truly the independent practice. So you're going to take your time and you're going to do your very best on this. I'm going to read through the instructions and then I'm going to scroll down because there's a total of five. So let's read through the instructions. If you can't see this, just listen. Select the statement that uses the term correctly. I've given you a sample number of multiple choice statements. Okay? There's four different multiple choice statements. And it says to select the statement that uses the term correctly. I've inserted each of the five terms that we discussed today. Each of them are in a completely different number. And each of them has four multiple choice options of statements. All that you have to write is the word, then read through each statement carefully, select which statement uses that word best, and then write that statement on your paper. That's all that you have to do. Write the word, read each multiple choice statement option, make your selection, write that selection on your paper. Again, if you're in the 12th grade, you're doing this exact same type of assignment, but with your words. And so I would fast forward and then come back as you need to. I'm going to scroll down, pause the video as you need to, or if you're in 12th grade, this is the time that you would go to your assignment. Let's get started.
that concludes our lesson. Make sure you take your two separate assignments with your notes and turn them in. Thank you.